right, all right, all right. Here we are. Something to uh, wet the old whistle. We don't want to uh, have the old throat getting dry on us in our uh, philosophical discussions in regard to ethics. Now, do we? Of course not. All right, so where are we today? Discussion on ethics, right? So as we go through our ethical theories today, we're going to continue to move through these and we're going to talk about utilitarianism. Now, before we get into utilitarianism, what I'd like to do is offer maybe a, a concluding thought in regards to our <clears throat> the moral theory or the amoral theory of, of relativism that we spoke about uh, earlier. Now, I'm not sure that I mentioned this in the lecture, so I want to make sure that I do. And that one of the things that we're going to, and we're going to constantly bring this up uh, as we go through our ethical theories, one of the things that we want to do is we want to make sure not only to evaluate and, and examine some of the claims of these, uh, these ethical theories, but we also want to apply these these theories, uh, these teachings existentially, meaning how do they relate to our lives, right? Like how do they how do they fit in regard to our decision making process in regard to moral choices? Or, and here's the big one that I want to talk about in regard to uh, moral relativism, is how do they how does each theory account for moral guilt. Now think about that. How does each ethical theory, now obviously you're, you're not going to know some of these other sets of yet, but already with moral relativism, having gone through the lecture, you're going to try to connect the dots, so to speak, in what moral relativism claims about objective rights and wrongs, right, or absolute rights and wrongs, and the fact that humans, by and large, experience real moral guilt, right? If there is no real right and wrong, then why feel guilty? Now, some may say, oh, well, because you've evolved to feel guilt, right? Or you've been, you know, because you've been brought up within a culture, and so it's maybe it's been inculcated within you, it's been ingrained within you, so now you have these feelings of guilt. Okay, whatever. But now say that you've been, quote-unquote, enlightened, right? And you realize, says the moral relativist, that there really is no real right and wrong, then what do you do with guilt? Why do you why do you continue to have this gnawing sense of of right and wrong when you know that it ought not be there under say something like moral relativism? I think that guilt, I think that moral guilt is one of the clues uh, in regards to right and wrong, right? There's a clue there that helps us to know that no if this theory, if this particular theory, in this instance, say moral relativism, and we'll look at later even utilitarianism, utilitarianism but if the, whatever if theory X, whatever theory you're talking about, let's also remember how does it account for, or what does it do with guilt? Meaning, how does it account for it, right? Why, how, why does it say it's there? But then also, should it be there as a logical extension of the theory itself. So say something like moral relativism, it really shouldn't even be there, right? Once you become educated, enlightened, uh, intellectually captivated, once you realize that moral relativism is true, if it were true, right? right obviously, you, you guys know where I stand. I believe it's not only false, but patently false. But if it were true, then what would be the ex logical extension or the implications for something like moral guilt. And conversely, uh, acts that you know are right, right, correct, proper moral behavior. Now, having said that, <clears throat> also I want to add just a concluding thought too about ethical egoism. 
and your text may have already went into this, you know, a little deeper. Uh, so this may be a bit of a review for you, again, depending on how in-depth our text goes here. But I had mentioned that ethical egoism was something like a moral relativism in a terrible tuxedo, right? Because if ethical egoism is true, well, first let's distinguish. There's, there's, there's one particular theory that would say something like, uh, well, everyone just all, always and only acts in their own self-interests. Well, <clears throat> there's a couple couple few problems with that. One, it, there's been many philosophers that argue that that's just patently false. And I'm not trying to connect, uh, commit the, uh, you know, ad hoc or appeal to authority fallacy there, I should say. But I do just think that that would be something, again, maybe our text will go into and you can look at that, why they would say that that's false. But probably I would say the most fundamental reason that that's false is simply because if everyone is always acting in accord with their own selfish interests, well, then that becomes an epistemological problem um, in regard to how do you even know it's true, right? Are you pursuing things because they're true? Are you making choices because they're true or right choices? Are you making choices because they're completely and only beneficial to you? Well, if they're only, if you're doing it for the second reason, the latter reason, that they're only um, beneficial to you um, and you're selfishly doing them for that particular purpose, then you really are, you pull the epistemological rug out from under your feet in regards to the pursuit of the truth of the matter. You don't even know if it's true, right? Well, how do you know? You, how, why can't it be true? Well, maybe it is, but you can't know because you're only making choices based on your own selfish interest. Not because you're necessarily interested in the truth of the matter. So there's that. We toss it out. But, on the other hand, if one ought to always do or act in accord with their own selfish interests, whatever benefits them, which would be ethical egoism as an ethical theory, well, then it's just hard to see how that doesn't necessarily just reduce to or melt down into just moral relativism. If everyone's doing what benefits themselves, then it's hard to see how that differs, again, in any real or robust or distinct sense from just moral relativism, that everybody's all, that's what they're just doing anyway, right? They're all doing their own thing, and, you know, hey, do your own thing. Now, let's move into utilitarianism. Enough about these other silly things, that these other circum... Did I say anything there? No, not really. All right, so, utilitarianism. Now, this is going to be our first, from what we've discussed in our uh, lecture so far, if I'm not miscounting, this is our third lecture. So, thus far, we've talked about you know, thousand foot overview of, of all these ethical theories thus far. Um, then we moved into moral relativism, um, which is an amoral, you know, for our purposes here, that's what we're saying anyway, that it's an amoral theory. Uh, that's just saying there's really not any. Uh, and then we just briefly right now just mentioned ethical egoism, which, <clears throat> again, our text can go into more depth than that, most likely. Uh, you can You can evaluate that you know, even more in depth if you'd like. But in my view, uh, it's just moral relativism in a really bad, shoddy tuxedo, right? So utilitarianism, that brings us to this point. Now, why did I just say all that I just said? Well, because utilitarianism differs because it's trying to give us a real ethical system that gives you real rights, real wrongs, real objective rights and real objective wrongs. And for our purposes, we're kind of using these two terms interchangeably, even though they're really distinct, but absolute rights and absolute wrongs. Things are absolute, there are some things that are absolutely wrong and there are some things that are absolutely right, um, or objectively right, objectively wrong. Utilitarianism is gonna be the first theory um, that we discuss, ethical theory, that's going to try to give us that. Now, you may recall that I, I've stated that it's sort of a false view that all atheists uh, or all non-theists are just a bunch of moral relativists, right? Or they just go around doing whatever they want and, you know, well, maybe they do. But technically speaking, at least in the world of philosophy, most atheists, most philosophical atheists, are not moral relativists. They don't just 
think that there are no true objective or absolute rights and wrongs. What they do is they just think that you don't need God, per se, to ground those rights or wrongs or to account for real rights and wrongs. They think that uh, there are, is at least one ethical theory um, that it can account for real rights and real wrongs. So it would be a straw man to say something like, well, yes, you're an atheist, so you don't believe in real rights and wrongs. Well, if they're a sophisticated atheist, an intellectual atheist, say, specifically trained in something like philosophy, well, that would just be false. They may say, well, absolutely not. I believe in obje objective rights and wrongs, and I'm, uh, I believe utilitarianism uh, can give us these. So, having said that, let's look at utilitarianism. On our first slide here, overview. Utilitarianism, UT, not urinary tract or University of Tennessee, but obviously short for utilitarianism here for our purposes. Utilitarianism is the prescriptive and normative ethical theory that claims that the moral choice, the good thing is, dot, dot. This is what utilitarianism claims, right? To do, quote, that which produces the greatest pleasure, the greatest good, the most flourishing for the greatest number of folks, all right, is the right course of action, is the ethical choice, the correct ethical choice, the good choice, right? So let's look at that real quick. Let's unpack that very quickly. First, prescriptive or normative ethical theory. Remember, we said they're descriptive uh, types of, of ethical theory, something like you know, moral relativism. It just describes how people act. But remember, prescriptive or normative is trying to give you the way that you ought to act, the way that you're supposed to act, right? Recall, remember this? Um, utilitarianism and the theories that we will discuss thus far, all of the ethical theories that we'll discuss thus far, are thus far, are, are from here onwards, I should say, all are going to be prescriptive or normative, meaning that if they run, if they work, if these theories hold, then they claim to give you real, true, objective rights and wrongs. Uh, they're not saying that, well, these are just, this is just good advice, or this is the way things, uh, you know, ought to be, well, you know, if, blah, blah, blah. No, these are saying that these really, if they work, are giving you really, real absolutes and real objective rights and wrongs. Utilitarianism, utilitarianism tries to do this. So, how does it do this? What's its axiom? Because all ethical theories are going to have some sort of fundamental axiom that they're working, uh, that they're revolving around, right? So here's its axiom. Um, this can be a little more technical according to which particular philosopher or utilitarian or ethicist that you're reading or studying. But for our purposes here, um, it's simply this, that utilitarianism is this. Look, you do whatever, whatever action produces the greatest pleasure for the greatest number of people is the right thing to do. It is the good thing to do. It is the moral thing to do. Again, you'll see right here in the slide, sometimes it's called the greatest pleasure for the greatest number of people or greatest good for the greatest number of people. Um, the most flourishing, whatever contributes to the flourishing of the greatest number of people um, or the best consequence, uh, you could say, for the greatest number of people. Now, I don't want to get into criticisms already, but let's go ahead and point out that you see how this can, in some sense, become a little messy already because, well, wait a minute, is the good synonymous with pleasure? And is pleasure synonymous with good? And is flourishing synonymous with pleasure? And is pleasure synonymous, synonymous with flourishing? which is synonymous with good, right? So you already can, you see it already starts to get a little hairy already right off the bat. But let's just forget that for now and continue to move on. We'll come back to that possibly. Now, this is a consequentialist type theory, meaning that what is right and what is wrong, rather, or not rather, but in addition to, what is right and what is wrong is determined by the consequences that result from that. Right? So before you make an ethical choice, before you make any sort of moral choice, uh, 
you have to ask yourself, and there's a methodology for doing this, depending on, you know, again, who you're reading. There's different methodologies for doing this, for determining this. But what you want to ask yourself basically is, what will the consequences of this particular choice bring about? Namely, will this particular choice that I'm about to do bring about the most pleasure for the most people, or the most good for the most people, the most flourishing for the greatest number of people, so on. So in that sense, it's consequentialist. Now, you already begin to see how this is going to stand in stark contrast to another ethical theory that we're going to talk about, uh, specifically uh, Immanuel Kant's deontological ethic. And you've probably heard this as well. You, maybe you've heard your, your mama, you know, or your grandmama say something like, uh, or, you know, say in a movie you're watching, you've heard someone say, you do the right thing to heck with the consequences. Or you do the right thing right now and you let the consequences take care of themselves. Or you may have heard it this way. Look, man, the end does not justify the means. What you're doing is wrong. I don't care what it produces. What you're doing right now is wrong. The end cannot justify the means. See the problem? That's already, that's an ethical theory that's in stark contrast to this because utilitarianism, if it's concerned with the consequences, if the consequences determine the uh, morality or immorality of the choice, what do you think it says in regards to the end justifying the means? Well, obviously it says the exact opposite, right? It says, uh, no, it is the end that determines whether the means are justified or not, right? Meaning that if the end works out, Right. If it's a, if it produces a good end, well, then that means that the means themselves were good. This is what utilitarianism is going to claim. So let's look more into this. Now, your influential. Let me show you this something here. Okay, some of your influential founders and or slash proponents of this particular theory would be Jeremy Bentham. So Jeremy Bentham, 1600s, he was essentially. For the most part, you know, we could get technical on some of this, but for the most part, he's the founder of this type of ethical theory. His disciple, John Stuart Mill, comes on, elaborates on it, tweaks a bit, uh, tweaks bits and pieces of it, adds some things, adds some qualifications, some important qualifications that we may look at. And we've got somebody in the contemporary uh, day and age uh, uh, made famous in for his uh, involvement in what is called the uh, the new atheism or new atheistic type movement, four horsemen of the atheist, uh, new atheist, so to speak, a guy named Sam Harris uh, uh, propounds a version of or or puts forth a version, uh, a uh, contemporary type version of utilitarianism. And again, it's just going to his uh, specifically has to do with flourishing, what produces the greatest flourishing for the greatest number of people. And, in addition to those uh, not necessarily interesting facts, is you have two schools of thought in regard to utilitarianism. So someone might say, well, I'm a utilitarian, and you may jump on with some particular critique of utilitarianism, and they say, oh, wait a minute, that doesn't apply to me, because you're talking about act utilitarians, and I am actually a rule utilitarian. Now, we'll, we're going to concentrate for the most part on act utilitarianism. However, we will bring up rule utilitarianism uh, in a few moments, and we'll discuss that uh, a little bit. For, but, for the, for, but for the purposes of this, this course uh, in ethics and the purposes of our discussion on utilitarianism, we're going to mainly discuss act utilitarianism. Now, the reason I mention these names is simply because I'm not so much concerned that you know the historical dates and the, and the, and the names of these individuals, but you, obviously uh, you just you need to know who they are uh, to have any sort of educated discussion on the matter. It's not going to hurt you in any sense. All right, so let's look at some of the appeals of this theory. Let's look at some of the appeals of ethical utilitarianism or utilitarian, utilitarianism as an ethical theory. Now, the first appeal might be this. In theory, at least, it's seemingly simple to apply, right? Um, and you see where I put here, no degree necessary. Meaning, 
There seems to be something rather intuitive about taking your consequences into account before you make some particular decision, right? Especially some big, momentous moral decision, right? You want to take into account, um, well, if I do this, what will this bring about, right? That seem, There seems to be something intuitive about that, and there seems to be something correct about that. I don't, I don't think that we necessarily have to object offhand that uh, it's wrong to take into account uh, the consequences of your decision. Now, you also see how that uh, directly entails that you don't need a degree, right? You don't have to have a big philosophy degree. Uh, to, you know, imagine, say, a farmer working on his tractor, and he's trying, you know, say he gets a phone call and he needs to make a decision about something. He doesn't necessarily have to go through, again, in contrast to, say, Kantian deontology, he doesn't have to say something like, well, all right, if this categorical imperative is in play and then I do this and it results in a contradiction, he obviously, he's not doing any of that, right? But it really might be simple for him to say, well, man, if I do this, well, then this will happen, right? And that ain't good. Or if I do this and this will happen, well, that's good, right? So it seems pretty simple for the every, everyday average person uh, to appeal to or to... Uh, put into play as they're making some sort of ethical choice or if they're in some sort of uh, decision-making process where they have to make these types of choices. It doesn't seem difficult, right? So that seems like an appeal. At least in theory, it seems like it's easy to apply. Hey, if I do this, what will happen? And if I don't do this, what will be the result? And vice versa. Now, you've already heard me make mention a few times of Kantian deontology, right, in regards to it as an ethical theory. Now, this is another appeal of utilitarianism, is that it seems to avoid something that we call the rigid, rigid, did it. <laughs> Easy for me to say, right? Maybe I need some of this. Won't tell you what's in here. I'm just kidding, that's just water. So rigidity, or the strict legalism, the strict legalism of deontology. So, meaning that if I go ahead and give the example here, this helps to clarify that. This, one of the standard de uh, examples is imagine the Nazis at the door, right? They're knocking at the door, you know, World War II era, and they ask a group of, say, uh, somebody, some, some individuals who are part of the resistance movement in, in, uh, in Germany or Eastern Europe, and they're, and they're hiding Jews in the basement, right? Or they're hiding Jews somewhere, you know, in their vicinity. And let's say the Nazis say, tell me the truth. Are you hiding any Jews here? Are you hiding any Jews in your basement, in your attic, in your home, in your vicinity, right? Well, this seems to avoid, right, the awkwardness of lying, right? So, so something like Constantology Remember, somebody might say, you do the right thing right now, and you let the consequences take care of themselves, right? It's your duty to tell the truth, because it's always wrong to not tell the truth. It's wrong to lie. And if you lie, you're doing wrong. And if you're doing wrong, then you're trying to basically, maybe somebody might say, essentially, play God. You do the right thing, and you let the consequences take care of themselves. Now, there just seems to be something rather off, to put it very mildly, that if there's some, you know, guy at the door, these Nazis uh, in this example at the door, and you have your, let's say that you're hiding the Jews in the basement, um, it seems wrong to say, you know what, I, I can't lie, it's wrong to lie, um, yeah, there's Jews in the basement, well, and, then, and then watch them march off uh, to be tortured and are killed, right, there, there's some, it seems to be something just clearly and obviously off um, with doing something like that. Or another famous example, standard example might be, let's say that you've borrowed a firearm from your neighbor. Let's say you wanted to go on a hunting trip or whatever and you didn't have the particular uh, you know, caliber weapon that you needed to take down a, a bigger you know, game animal or whatever. So you borrowed your neighbor's, uh, you know, let's say he's got a you know, a 270, right? A rifle that he, that that will that is sufficient to uh, take down the game that you're hunting. Well, let's say he borrowed it, 
But when he when you borrowed it, he said, "Now I'm going to let you borrow this, but when I need it back, uh, you know, I, I expect to that you return my firearm to me, right?" And you, of course, you, 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 yeah, that makes okay. Yeah, right. I'm not. I don't want to steal it, right? When, whenever you need it back, it's your. It's yours. You know, I'll give it back to you. So let's say that across the street, you see the neighbor, and he's fighting violently with, say, his wife for. Uh, let's say something absolutely trivial. Say that she's, uh, say she wanted to be sweet. She, she's, you know, prepared uh, the meal for the evening, and she's burnt uh, the, the 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 casserole. Right. Well, he's just he f flies off the handle. He's he's clearly ha he clearly has problems. He's he's got a temper issue. Let's just even say he's a, just an evil individual. He comes over to your home, right, with the intent to terminate his wife and he says hey look you know you remember when I borrowed when you borrowed my firearm I need it back right now and you promised that when I asked for my firearm that you would return it and I know you're not going to break your promise uh, and go back on your word and not give me this farm but obviously you know that if you give him this thing then it's going to be disastrous right it's going to result in tragedy and that's the last thing that you ought to do is return this thing to this guy, especially in this state. Now, utilitarianism supposedly, at least on the face of it, gives you an out, right? Because you're taking into effect, uh, account the consequences, right? The, well, what will happen if I do this? Will this help uh, the most number of people if I give this guy's gun back? Well, absolutely not. Or will this help the most number of people if I uh, tell this Nazi the truth? Uh, say you've got 50 you know, Jews in the basement. Well, no, this this won't do that. So, no, the right thing to do is uh, tell a lie to the Nazis and say I don't have any, and the right thing to do is to break my word and not give this guy his firearm. As opposed to, uh, and again, we'll talk about this theory uh, next time, but as opposed to the strict um, um, staunchness of sticking by a particular principle, even if these horrible results seem to be the consequence of such a thing. So that, should, that seems to be an appeal, right? That it takes these, these very difficult choices into account, these, the consequences of difficult choices into account. Now, this next appeal has to be understood in its historical context. When Bentham was developing his system, this ethical theory of utilitarianism, he was coming out of or within the era of what is called in philosophy a lot of times the Enlightenment era. So at this particular point in time, there's a separation from religion. Uh, there's a separate separation from religious thought. And we are trying to, or they are trying to get away from um, uh, religion being the ultimate in regards to decision-making processes and, and things of that nature. Um, what we were trying to establish was simply the fact about the Enlightenment, right, and how this came out of the result of the Enlightenment trying to distance itself, trying to distance uh, uh, itself from religious type of thinking from metaphysical type of thinking. And metaphysical, I don't mean like, you know, alchemy and that sort of silly stuff in a, you know, bookstore. I mean, metaphysics in, as, in, as in the philosophical terms of that. Natures and essences of things. Now, as you see on your slide here, this particular theory supposedly has an axiom, remember its fundamental starting point, that's not religious, meaning you don't, have, supposedly you don't have to be uh, a Christian or, or a Muslim or practice some sort of uh, theism in any shape, form, or fashion um, to use this quote-unquote non-moral criteria. It's supposed to be relatively uncontroversial. What was that axiom? What was that non-moral criteria? Whatever produces the greatest number for the greatest, num uh, greatest, fo greatest number of folks is the good, right? That is the good. That is what you should do. Now, <clears throat> this was basically, when we talked about uh, Bentham and we talked about how he determined that, how do you determine what the greatest number is, um, or the greatest, <laughs> count up the greatest number, right? But how do you determine the great, what the greatest uh, pleasure would be? 
he had this thing called the hedonic calculus, right? Hence the word hedonism, right? Hedonic hedonism. That had to do with how you would add up pleasure um, and differentiate that between pain and, and, and whatnot. Now, his, his disciple Mill was, would essentially say you can evaluate the differences. All right, so back again. <laughs> Got all kinds of interruptions today. So, hopefully we'll have no more of those. That's out of the way. So, again, back to enlightenment, trying to get out of religious types of thinking. So, hence this non-moral criteria. Let's continue to move on. And again, Bentham tries to distinguish or work through this with the hedonic cal calculus. Uh, we're not going to worry uh, over that for now. Um, but just suffice to say that what that was supposed to have done, uh, what the calculus was supposed to do have done was to essentially crunch numbers. Meaning that if this particular thing gave this much pleasure, then, uh, well, you know what? I'm just going to have to go through the calculus, calculus to some extent. Let's set, well, you know what? Let's wait till we go through some of the objections, and that'll be a very easy spot that we can bring up something like the calculus. So let's go ahead and start that. Now, this last appeal is it seems to be intuitive that consequences should be factored within moral choices, right? So this goes back to the first appeal. Let's flip back here. Um, when we talk about this here, then theory, it's, seeming, it's a seemingly simple theory to apply, no degree necessary, take into account your consequences. Um, that seems to go very nicely with this, again, this appeal here that seems intuitive that consequences should be factored within any moral choice. Now, again, I don't think that on the face of it, any of these appeals that we've given thus far are controversial. Would you grant that it seems intuitive that your consequence should be factored into a, within a moral choice? Sure. Would you grant that uh, that this seems to be an appeal that you don't have to ha adhere to any specific religion in order in order to uh, accept this basic premise that hey. Uh, whatever you do, if it provides the greatest number for the greatest number of people, or the greatest flourishing for the greatest number of people, that that should be a good thing. Seems okay. Um, this the second appeal again. Well, what about you know if there's a Nazi at the door? Do you really just do the quote unquote right thing and not even care that there's going to be all these lives that are uh, destroyed? And again, really easy. You know, no uh, working through logical puzzles to try to figure out. Uh, what you're supposed to do, right? So, having said that, we're going to look at some significant, not just problems, but significant problems when you take this axiom and try to make this your end-all, be-all for moral reasoning or ethical reasoning. Now, our first significant problem is this. It if, if, if you take this axiom that whatever produces the greatest good for the greatest number of people, then it almost always is insufficient to protect the, uh, the rights of the minority. Think of a few examples. Slavery, right? If you can crunch the numbers, right? If you make the numbers work, say there are more people that benefit from slavery than there are that do not benefit from slavery, then to uphold slavery is the moral thing to do, right? So if you take the American South um, and even prior to the, the disagreements between the North and South when slavery was more rampant throughout all the, the colonies and so forth, um, if the numbers work, right, then you should have slaves, right? Not only uh, should you have slaves, but you should do what it takes to promote slavery, whether it be kidnapping, you know, uh, when you visit the west coast of Africa or, or wherever the slaves were gathered from um, for those particular purposes. Uh, you ought to do those sorts of things. Or even take into account modern slavery. Um, it is often said that there are that in the modern era there is more slavery than there was even in that particular era but era is just hidden now it's just more well uh, uh, disguised and and and, and, uh, and um, what's the word I'm looking for I guess for lack of a better words just hidden 
it's just not as out in the open as it is or as it was then. Uh, the sex trade, um, the trafficking of children for slavery. So if the numbers work, if that provides more quote unquote pleasure, uh, if that makes more people happy at the end of the day, um, if that makes more people flourish, you know, again, however you're going to define flourish at the end of the day, say, you know, twisted businessmen or whoever they may be that are um, capitalizing off these sorts of things, um, then that's what you ought to do. Or take the issue of same-sex marriage or any, any, any of these particular cultural hot-button topics. If there's more people that benefit um, for, for allowing it or for not allowing it, then that's what you ought to do. Again, the minority here. So if, so think of whatever side of the aisle you stand on in regards to the same-sex marriage um, issue, which I think is pretty obvious, you know, which <laughs> side. How, however, having said that, let's just say, for instance, that if that is the minority and that doesn't cause flourishing for the greatest number of people, then you ought not do that. Right? In fact, you ought to suppress everything that you can to do it. Now, on the other hand, on utilitarianism, if the proponents of traditional marriage are in the minority, and so that, same-sex marriage, causes the more, more people to flourish, then you ought to suppress anyone that disagrees, right? Again, it's all about the numbers. What, what are the numbers and how does the data crunch? Right, so here's a nice little sweet... Uh, picture of your friendly neighborhood cannibal tribe, right? So if you've got two explorers surrounded by these guys uh, in the middle of nowhere, and again, as long as the, the data, as long as the numbers work, the data crunches out, uh, then the right and moral thing to do would be to turn over the two little tourists to these guys to be eaten um, alive or cooked or boiled or broiled or, you know, filleted or however it, they do all that kind of stuff. That would be the moral thing to do, right? Now, let's look at some of the deeper issues. This justifies and actually deems moral seeming injustices. Again, because utilitarianism is radical in the sense that it's the right thing to do, the moral thing to do, is to do the action. Again, think about this is to do the action that will cause the apparent greatest flourishing or the greatest pleasure for the greatest number of people, right? So let's look at our, in, our, our first example here, an innocent person. Suppose that you have a man who is absolutely innocent, right? He's, he's committed no crime. He's done nothing wrong at all. However, you know that if you let this man go free, let's say that you're the judge and you're a utilitarian, if you let this man go free, you know that there will be absolute chaos in the city. There will be fires, there will be riots, there will be all sorts of, of, of terrible things, looting, shootings. It will just be chaos, right, if you, if you let this man go free because public opinion is so against this particular person. However, let's say that you have evidence, conclusive evidence that shows, that reveals that he is absolutely innocent. Right, and let's say that he even, he even has a wife, and he has a, he has children, um, he's, a, he's he has a family. Now, on utilitarianism, what should you do? What will provide the greatest pleasure, the greatest flourishing for the greatest number of individuals, right, or for society or whatnot? Well, in utilitarianism, it would be to convict this innocent man. Now, and not only would it be the right thing to do to convict this innocent man and send him away, but it would be permissible to frame this innocent man. Remember, if you're contemplating some particular decision, let's say that right now, all right, should I frame this guy or should I not frame him? The principle is not what's important. The principle is not, well, you know, it's wrong to frame people. The, that, that's, again, that's a deontological type ethic, right? At least in, 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 in this regard. Your choice, when you're making this choice, is, well, wait a minute, should I frame him? Well, that depends. What would produce the greatest number, uh, what would produce the greatest pleasure, the greatest happiness for the greatest number, the greatest flourishing for the greatest number of people? Well, in this instance, it would be to frame this innocent man.
Now, conversely, what if this guy is absolutely guilty? You've got conclusive evidence that he has committed a heinous, heinous, heinous act. But public opinion is as such that this person, if you convict him, then it, there'll, there'll be riots on the, on the on, on that aspect. Say that, say that there's there's race involved, right? There's ethnicity uh, issues to take into account here. And if you convict this man, though you know absolutely that he's guilty, you know that terrible consequences will resu result if you convict this individual. Well, on, on utilitarianism, it doesn't matter what happened to the victim. It doesn't matter what this particular individual did. Remember, what matters is the consequences that your decision will bring. So you have to pronounce this man innocent, even though he's absolutely evil, and let him go, right? to avoid these terrible consequences. Now, think about that movie, The Purge. Remember, this is that movie where uh, you've got, the, I think, I believe it takes place in the United States, it's at least supposed to be some sort of Western society. Anyway, they allow one night a year uh, for anyone to do anything that they wish to do. There's no law, nothing is illegal. And so you've got these, I haven't even seen the movie, you don't even have to see the movie to know the basic premise of the movie. And the basic premise is you just allow um, these individuals, anyone in society, to do whatever they want to do on this one particular day of the, uh, of the year because according to the movie, uh, the, the plot of the movie, that if this is allowed, crime is just significantly reduced. Basically, people are allowed to just build up their animosity, build up their... their the darkness within them um, because they know that on a certain day of the, of the year they get to release all of this, right? And so overall, the crime is, is, is way down. Um, everything, quote-unquote, works out for the greatest number. That's the greatest flourishing. It produces the greatest pleasure for the greatest number of people. Um, so long as we just allow any absolute hell to break loose on this one day uh, out of the year. And so nothing's illegal. So what should you do under utilitarianism? That's literally a utilitarian type ethic. Um, is that, well, you know, this seems terrible, but it actually works out for the best. Now, here's the radical nature of this. Well, let me give the, this, these other two examples first before I, before I point to this radical uh, implication. Imagine you have a child, let's say that we're on our philosophy class, we're in our philosophy class here, and I say, hey, guess what, guys, we're going to go take, we're going to go uh, on a study trip, and we're going to travel to the Greek islands, right, and, and you know, the, the, the land of, of Plato and Aristotle and Socrates, and we're going to study philosophy. We'll say on the plane trip there, we get in a crash, and we land on some particular island, and let's say that one of the individuals in the group is an absolute sociopath. And the only way that we can keep this guy or this girl, whoever it happens to be, we don't know, um, at night from just absolutely terrorizing everyone uh, on the trip for the rest of the duration of our lives that we're stranded on this island and doing unspeakable things is to take one of the individuals that we know is not the perpetrator of, of these things, take one of these, one of us, strap them to a tree and let this this sociopath do whatever he wants to this individual. And like the slide says, imagine this is a child, right? An innocent child. Um, now, let's say that this evil sociopath, because he's allowed to do this to this person, this, this child even, well, that now we don't have to worry about being uh, whatever this guy's doing, right? You, the, 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 the ramifications... The consequences to us are gone because we're allowing him to do this. Now, if the numbers work, if that provides the greatest pleasure for the greatest number of people, then that's what we ought to do, right? You ought to tie up the child, give them to this sociopath, whoever he is, and let him do uh, unspeakable uh, things simply because that provides the greatest number for the greatest, uh, or the greatest pleasure for the greatest number of people. Now, here's the radical thing that I want to point out. Does what does tying up the child and giving them to the sociopath does allowing the the one day of, of the year to go for people to go absolutely crazy does framing the innocent person or, or letting go of the convicted does utilitarianism justify those actions? No, it doesn't justify them. 
You say, well, wait a minute, I thought you just said, well, that would be the right thing to do. Right, but it's more radical than that. It is the right thing to do under utilitarianism, but it doesn't justify them because ju when you say it justifies them, that's what you're saying there is there's some standard of behavior that this, this allows for or this gives an excuse for, this justifies, right? You're not justifying behavior. Justifies assumes a standard outside itself that, well, it's really not necessarily bad assuming that. Remember, utilitarianism is not justifying the behavior. It says these actions right here on your slide, they're not justified. They are the moral thing to do. What? They're the good. Those are good things. Framing innocent people is a good thing. It doesn't justify framing innocent people. It is a good thing to frame innocent people if it provides the greatest pleasure for the greatest number. It is a good thing to know, to let the convicted, the, 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 the guilty guy go. It is a good, now listen how radical, it doesn't justify giving the child to the sociopath. It says that you are a good and moral man. You are a good and moral individual for doing, for giving the child to the sociopath because it provides the greatest number for the greatest, uh, greatest pleasure for the greatest number. That is the good thing to do. That is what the moral thing to do would be. That is absolutely right in that situation or objectively right in that situation to do that. So you see how radical that is? It doesn't justify what we would normally consider to be terrible things. It says that they are good to do. It is a good to do those things under that circumstance. You see, that's radical. This last example here, another famous example, is uh, a physician that kills a perfectly innocent and, say, friendly and amicable, nice family man and steals his organs to give to other people who need an organ, right? Because, yes, you're killing one person, but you're making six people live, so to speak. Or let's say that you could take more organs and you make more people live. So the right thing to do, again, it doesn't just allow the surgeon to kill the innocent man. It says he ought to kill the innocent man to harvest organs and spread them around, right? Distribute the wealth, so to speak. That should sound a bit familiar, right? Now, if you think that there's something wrong with that, well, then I would say that you're probably uh, barking up the right tree. Uh, those are significant red flags against uh, utilitarianism. Well, wait a minute. Are you saying that it's not good to take our consequences into account? Well, no. I think, yeah, I think it's, again, it's uncontroversial. I think we should take our consequences into account. But here's the problem. When you try to base, and this is what you're starting to see here with these significant problems, just when you're trying to base, when you're trying to build an entire ethical theory off an axiom that produces these sorts of results, you know, we're starting to see some problems, right? Now, the yappy dog I didn't mention, but basically it was just a humorous example of, let's say that you live in an apartment complex, there's a, what I call a yappy dog, you know, the kind of dog, you know, the, the kind that literally fit in the palm of your hand or sit on your lap. Uh, in other words, the kind of the dog that a hawk, a bird of prey, could easily pick up and carry off, right? That kind of thing. Let's say there's one of those, and it's driving everyone in the apartment complex absolutely bonkers, right? Well, what would be the ethical thing to do if you're a utilitarian? And you have the opportunity to rid the apartment complex of this particular yappy dog. Would, that, would it upset the owner? Absolutely. But it doesn't matter what produces the greatest number for the greatest group of folks, right? Or what produces the greatest pleasure for the greatest group of folks. Well, then you are morally obligated to, you should uh, make this dog disappear, to put it friendly, uh, to put it nicely. Um, if you think there's something wrong with that, again, you're starting to see some of the problems with basing an entire ethical theory off this particular axiom. Now, another difficulty would be this. How does one actually know the consequences of those large questions, right? So if what you're trying to do is figure out the consequences, well, if I do this, what will happen? Well, how do you know? And what's the time frame there, right? So let's say you go to frame the innocent individual. How do you know that the consequences will be one way or the other? When you take it, when everything is taken into account, if possible, 
How do you actually know the consequences on, again, very large questions? Again, it may be one thing to say, all right, well, should I give my sandwich to this guy right here or eat my sandwich? But what if it's a massive question of political interests or, say, on, on a national interest? Say that you're a politician and you're trying to make some very difficult ethical, ethical moral um, decision uh, that may have ramifications for for millions, if not billions of people, and will have ramifications for not just, you know, days or weeks, but for years and years, decades even. Well, some might say, or some have said, some utilitarians would say, well, look, you just do the best that you can in that, in that given instance. Okay, but that seems to still leave something very unsatisfactory uh, uh, to be discussed again. You don't want to just, quote-unquote, do the best. You want to know what you're doing because, remember, the axiom just is to provide the greatest pleasure for the greatest number. And if you can't do that in principle, then really what good is the axiom, right? Um, now, your text may go into that a little more if you're reading this particular text. You may not be um, uh, reading this particular text uh, in this instance of the course, but if, are, if you are, check that out on page 145 there. Um, but again, the large questions, knowing the consequences, knowing what will in, your decisions will entail, uh, seems to be a bit difficult, right? Now, this is another abstract sort of objection. So when we, we're talking about the greatest pleasure or we're talking about the flourishing for the greatest number of people, who decides this, right? What... It, is it the greatest pleasure or the greatest flourishing according to, say, Hitler or to Stalin, right, or to Bill Clinton or to George W. Bush or uh, Mother Teresa? Like, are, are we talking about the greatest number of pleasure for the greatest number of people? Well, according to, to who? who? Who defines this, right? Who? This kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier when we said, uh, when we notice that there may be a difficulty in saying, well, what is, is, is pleasure synonymous with good and is good synonymous with, uh, with, uh, with, with pleasure and with flourishing and so on and so forth. Now, again, who decides this? So a thought experiment may be, let's say, looking at the surviving prisoners here on, on uh, your slide, let's say that some sort of one of these apocalyptic scenarios comes through where these, you know, there's a zombie virus or whatever, and everyone is infected with this, except, say, uh, your prison population. Let's say because, let's say that somehow, in some way, they've been isolated for the, from the rest of the population in their in their jail cells and the prisons and whatnot. And the guards that come to and fro, uh, somehow they were even you know kept immune from that in these in, in their environment. And so let's say now that you have a very small, very small population or percentage of the population that was not incarcerated. And let's say that these prisons uh, were holding the, the, the worst of the worst criminals, right? And let's say now they outnumber the general population because of this apocalypse, uh, this viral apocalypse that, that swept through, the, 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 uh, through civilization and whatnot. Well, now, do those guys, to say that the, the criminals, say they're out now, there's no guards there, they can just freely open the gates and, and escape. Well, now that they outnumber everyone else, the general population, is it those guys that get to decide what it means to have the greatest pleasure for the greatest number of people? Uh, that's obviously going to, that's going to produce some difficulties, right? Um, because now you literally have, quote unquote, bad guys defining pleasure uh, defining uh, the good or uh, uh, flourishing and whatnot. Um, and if what they define as the good or the or pleasure or the flourishing is in contrast to those in the minority, the regular citizens, right? Well, it just doesn't matter. Those are the minority, right? They want to enact and do choices that give them the greatest pleasure um, for whatever's going on, right? Um, so again, just take into account who gets to define these things. Um, and again, your thought experiment where what if the numbers are reversed and that uh, normally a uh, normal, what we would say, bad course of action uh, is deemed to be the best for the most people.
Now, what if we have two utilitarian cultures, say two cultures that adopt utilitarianism, what if they come against one another? Well now, because there's nothing transcendent, there's no moral standards that are over and above the cultures themselves, or above utilitarianism in the sense that just whatever provides the greatest number for the greatest num uh, greatest pleasure for the greatest number of people, what if two utilitarian cultures, this culture here and this culture here, what if they come up against one another? Well, now, how do you determine what they should do, right? Say one culture wants to overtake the other culture. What are you supposed to do? And let's say that they're numerically equivalent. Well, you might say, hurry up, reproduce, right, to your, to your, your tribe or, your, or to your culture or to your country or whatnot um, to try to get more people so that, you know, there's more flourishing and there's more... Uh, happiness, there's more pleasure on your side than there would be on the other. But what if there's just two that are that are that are equal, or at least roughly equal? Um, what do you do? There's no standard, there's no ethical uh, uh, principles that can guide you if there if the pleasure is uh, is indeterminate, so to speak. There. Again, just something to keep in consideration. In fact, you may want to, depending on our assignments, you may want to, to develop that in a little more detail. Um, now, this is probably one that I would say is probably the biggest objection, or at least for me, um, I think philosophically this is probably the, the, the biggest uh, uh, objection, or the most problematic objection to utilitarianism. Remember that we said that it was supposed to be a non-moral uh, axiom or criteria or foundation, fundamental point that was not controversial. Now, think about this. Let's just read it off of the slide here. Utilitarianism. It must assume or presuppose that its basic axiom is morally obligatory before it even begins to be applied in reality, right? So it has to smuggle in a moral obligation there, right? But wait a minute. Who says that to provide the greatest number, greatest pleasure for the greatest number of people? Who says that's good? Who says that I should that I'm morally obligated to follow that that dictum? Who says that I'm morally obligated to follow that axiom? Why should I follow that? See, it assumes that you already have some sort of moral obligation to provide the greatest pleasure for the greatest number of people. But again, that's not self-evident, right? That I mean, Self-evident means it doesn't provide evidence unto, it, unto itself. In fact, it's fairly controversial. It may be true that to, sometimes the morally right thing to do may be to withhold pleasure from individuals or from people or withhold happiness temporarily, right? Or even in some instance, maybe never grant happiness in situation X to whatever. That seems to be just as plausible at times. So if it's not self-evident, this moral axiom, well then why should we adopt that? Again, what obligation is there to construct the system with blind tests, certain fair criteria, and so on without smuggling in some moral principle a priori on the face or beforehand? So what that's referring to is some have tried to say, well wait a minute, in answer to this last objection, well, who defines this? How do we keep that fair? Well, in theory, what we could do is thought experiments where you pretend that you don't know what your race is, you don't know what your sex is, what your gender is, what your uh, socioeconomic status is, what your uh, any of those things. So that let's say that you what you're thinking is that it's potential. It, it's possible that you could be born in in, in any of those particular circumstances. Now. If that's accepted, how can we come up with a moral system based on utilitarianism that would make it fair for all these people? But wait a minute. Again, that's not utilitarianism. Now you're having to smuggle, again, again, you're having to smuggle in moral assumptions that you ought to do that. But remember, if you're doing that, well, then now you don't need, more, you don't need utilitarianism. Now you're pulling in other moral criteria about fairness and equity and justice, regardless of which people group it, you know, would hurt or not hurt. Or you see what I'm saying? The problem is, again, now you're, you're smuggling in moral criteria apart from utilitarianism. But utilitarianism is, is supposed to give you, that's supposed to be what gives you the right and the good and what you ought to do and what you're not supposed to do, right? 
but you're cheating, all right? Now the utilitarian is cheating, um, at least I would argue here. So if we look at it this way and say, utilitarianism gives us the right and the good, right? Well, okay, what is the right and the good? To provide the flourish, the greatest amount of pleasure for the greatest number of people. Well, how do you know that's right? What's the moral obligation to perform that? Well, you can't say utilitarianism, right? Because utilitarianism is supposed to give you what the right is, what the good is. So you can't just assume that right off the bat without already assuming that you have a moral obligation to do that. That's arguing in a circle. Now, again, to be fair, every ethical theory is going to have to have some beginning point, some axiom. But again, it shouldn't be arbitrary. Right, and if you're going to start with some axiom, why not start with something that's more self-evident? Right, something that stands, um, provides evidence unto itself in the sense that you just can't get around it. You can get around uh, this utilitarian ethical principle. Again, remember, it's not self-evident that you ought to always provide the greatest pleasure or the greatest happiness or the greatest flourishing. That's not self-evident. In fact, it's arguable. Right, I mean, we can think you can think of possibly many, 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 many examples of of the right thing. Uh, at least plausibly, not providing pleasure, not providing flourishing or happiness, but maybe a difficult choice or action. Um, and you can, you, depending on our assignment, you may want to elaborate on that. Now, remember when we talked about hedonic calculus? Some would say, well, wait a minute, your example on the island with the girl, right? Well, wait a minute, if we crunch the numbers, people are not necessarily gaining pleasure from that because they're in distress, right? They can't sleep at night because they know that this is going on and so it doesn't provide the greatest pleasure for the greatest number and so on and so forth. All right, well, to look at the hedonic calculus, and you're going to see how this ties into this slide. Let's say that you score, and again, this is roughly the hedonic calculus, a very oversimplification of it, but it will get the point across. Let's say that you score pleasure on a scale of 1 to 100. And let's say that there are 10 of us, right? Now, let's say that we turn over the person to the sociopath, tie them up to the tree, the sociopath gets them and whatnot because we don't know who they are and all this sort of thing. Let's say that because of the distress of knowing what's going on, let's say that our pleasure is not, does not reach 100 on the scale of 1 to 100, but only goes to 50. Let's say it just distresses us so much that we're at 50 on our scale. Each person is at 50, right? Out of... Let's say out of the 10 people, um, eight of us are at a 50. The sociopath, however, is at a 100, and the, uh, the, obviously the individual is at a zero, right? The one who's undergoing all these things, right? Well, now, what is eight times 50? Crunch the numbers. That still <laughs> outdoes right the zero and we have to add in the hundred as well um of the sociopath because of his pleasures off off the tip of the charts right so even if ours is reduced dramatically dramatically again as long as the numbers work under the hedonic calculus well then that's what you just ought to do right it doesn't matter now see here's the problem tying in directly to this uh, this objection here, this problem is that no single person has any value at all. No one. Because you could substitute any of the individuals on the island, right? Or in any of these scenarios. Because it could be anyone. So really, who has the value? It's the group, right? The group or the mass, right? The populace. That's who has the value. But here's the irony of that. Here's the, the paradox of that maybe even worse than paradox. If no single person has intrinsic value, then nobody really has any value at all, right? If no single person has any intrinsic value, then there's no person overall that has any value, right? If, if, if you can constantly just crunch the numbers and swap one person for another person, then there's not a single person um, that has any value. So where do we derive 
value then? And, and why, why is the group valuable if there's really no single person within the group that contains any value at all? That seems to be a very uh, significant problem. Again, and so what we're left with is we're just left with merely numbers, statistics, and data, right? Because no person, no individual has any value because it's just all about the group. Well, and you could, again, what if someone were to say, yeah, but the group does have value. Like, well, okay, that's easy for you to say if you're in the group, right? Because you, the person making the objection, don't even have any, right? If the numbers work against you, then you lose it, right? So it's easy to say for the guy sitting within the group. However, if you're not, it's too bad, right? There's nowhere for you to go. Now, let's look at very quickly this whole aspect of rule utilitarianism. So what these guys want to say is uh, essentially, so that was my wife coming in and out doing a lecture. Uh, what can you do? I guess we can just continue. And that's what we'll have to do. So look, like we were saying, rule utilitarians. What these guys want to say is that, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. There are certain principles based off consequentialism, based off utilitarianism, that we already have in place before we make any decision, right? So it, we know that raping uh, an innocent individual always produce um, terrible consequences. There's never any uh, scenario, there's never any circumstance in which um, raping or framing innocent uh, people or you know, fill in the blank there, something that you think is extra heinous. There's never any context or circumstance where doing something like that will result in the greatest num greatest pleasure for the greatest number of people. So we have these principles to guide us um, before we make any of these decisions. Now, if you think that's a little suspect, you, I, I would argue that you're right. Um, one, when you say that you're working off consequentialist or utilitarian principles to have these rules, well, how do you know that, right? How do you, again, if just already beforehand, how do you know that situation X will always result in bad consequences, um, less flourishing, less pleasure for the greatest number, if you never let that particular action go into effect? You, don't, you, you literally can never know that, right? You literally can never know that if you never let it go into effect because you already assume it a priori. Now you start to sound like the Kantian deontologist, right? Where you have some sort of principle that it doesn't matter what happens, you cannot do this. But that doesn't sound like utilitarianism. That doesn't sound like um, that you're taking, you're giving anything more than lip service uh, to the consequences of some action, right? It sounds like you're cheating, and I would argue that you are cheating, right? I would try to argue that. Again, how does one, again, looking at your slide, how does one know if the rule were changed or reversed that it would not result in the greatest good, especially if you're assuming it beforehand, right? So that's just our brief look at rule uh, utilitarianism in contrast to act utilitarianism. Remember, act just bites the bullet and says, look, whatever happens, um, it doesn't matter how immoral you think it may be. It just matters what the consequences are, and then... The only reason you think it's immoral is because you're assuming that to begin with. Um, at least the rule utilitarians, I would argue, are tipping their hand. They're really giving, you know, giving away their, their true colors when they say that, you know, there's, there's, there's some things that just they could never, uh, you know, provide the greatest pleasure for the greatest number of people. So let's just don't ever do that. But I would say I'm glad first that they would do that. But it, it, seems really like they're tipping their hand that they just know beforehand, regardless of the consequences that may or may not come about, um, they know that there are some things that are just intrinsically wrong in and of themselves. Um, and it seems like uh, just lip service to say that it would always be um, the case that it wouldn't. But, oh, because we're utilitarians. Now, again, this is the question we, we ask again at the onset in regard to moral relativism and that we're going to try to, again, ask ourselves in regard to each of these ethical theories, and that is, what do we do with guilt, right? 
So let's say that you're the utilitarian and you give up the child to the sociopath on the island. You know under utilitarian uh, uh, principles that you've done quote unquote you haven't you're not justified in what you did. Remember, you what you did was right. It was good. It was the moral thing to do. But why do you feel guilty with that? Why do you feel why do you wrestle with this 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 concept of guilt when you know that what you've done was right? Right? Just under moral relativism, if you're a convinced moral relativist and you think there are no objective rights and wrongs, there are no absolute rights and wrongs, but you yet you feel guilty for you feel as if you are obligated to someone somewhere to to to, to, to say sorry, right? To to make something right. And the same thing here in regard to this, how does this account for moral guilt, right? Again, these are just the existential type questions that we have to ask ourselves when we're talking about um, any sort of moral or ethical theory. And they're valid, right? These are valid questions. You can't get around these. Now, a couple takeaways. Again, I don't think it's wrong to say that your consequences should be taken into account when you're making some sort of moral or ethical decision. I think that's a, probably a good thing to do. The problem with this, just as the slide says here, is that you cannot construct an entire ethical theory or an entire ethic based upon just the consequences without what? Without all of these significant problems, with these disastrous results, right? So again, the problem is not taking in t your consequence into account. The problem is when you try to say that the right thing to do should always be based on the consequences. Otherwise, you get exactly what we've just talked about, utilitarianism and its disastrous results. Now, overall, do you think this is convincing or unconvincing as an ethical theory? Um, if you think that those problems are tr are tr truly are significant and truly uh, uh, are quote unquote wrong, then you're probably not going to be too convinced by utilitarianism as an ethical theory. Now, I've just left these concluding thoughts here just to fill in a couple of the details that we haven't necessarily uh, went into as, in, in as much depth. There's not much here. You'll see on your slides when you go through these. It's just roughly one large paragraph uh, that I wrote uh, a, a significant time ago um, that you can look through here um, that again just kind of fill in some of the gaps. Uh, in our overall lecture here. Uh, also, this you know does nothing more than supplement our, the reading from our texts as well. Now, with that said, we are concluding our discussion, our thoughts, our little lecture here on utilitarianism, and we'll pick back up next time uh, with our discussion of ethics um, with, well, I'll let that be a surprise. Hope you enjoyed the lecture. Adios.